Our third storyteller tonight is not a newbie to the stage. She is a queer open mic performer. She has been a feature. She's told it body a number of times. And uh, I think she's going to keep her pants on for this performance. I'm not sure. Don't boo her. Give her a big hand. Blythe Baldwin. No, no pants off. But I will, you know, give you something for your trouble. So I made this t-shirt. And I wore it on the way over here. And I'm going to tell you, I got a lot of really interesting stares. It says, I'm not Polly, but my girlfriend is exclamation point, because this might be surprising to some people. And there were a lot of really interesting interactions on the part of like, oh God, you know. <laughs> I was surprised that they had that reaction, because I'm like, well, you must know what Polly is, so what's your fucking problem, prude? <laughs> yeah. So the story I'm going to tell you tonight, much like Jonathan's, is a story that's kind of more centered around a personal victory, because I personally can't think of anything sexier to tell you about than somebody that, you know, just gets over all the bullshit that life throws at you and gets exactly what they want out of their sex life. So, you know, it's like from the moment you enter this world, you get no real relationship experience or guidance. You know, it's just like all this garbage about like what it's supposed to act like and look like and feel like. You know, and then you get all this sexual society shame thrown on top of it. And it's like, don't do this, do that. That's gross. That's wrong. You know, it's just a wonder that anyone ever gets to a place in their life where they really enjoy fucking, you know? So it's like the story I would like to tell you tonight is how I got exactly what I want out of my fucking love life. Uh, to tell you this story, I have to go back a little bit in time. Uh, two years ago, I was not the person you see before you ripping my shirt off or dropping my pants on stage. I was a miserable, depressed individual. I had no friends of my own. I'm serious. They all lived in other states or some shit. You know, it was just really bad. I hated my life. You know, and it got so bad that my girlfriend at the time dumped me. It was like my life was like a queer country song. I just, you know, it was like a wake-up call, and I thought, you know, fuck this shit, man. I gotta figure out what I want out of life, and I gotta go get it, grab it by the balls, and just milk it for all that it's worth. <laughs> so I started writing poetry and performing, and I started meeting all these fantastic new people, and I started making friends, and one of the people that I met during this time was this woman named Gina. Now, the first thing I recognized when I saw Gina was her smile. It's a little cockeyed, which is, like, exactly the right thing to turn a pervert on like me. And it didn't hurt that she was just totally my type. You know, she's tall, she's curvy in all the right places, and the both of us are just miserable, shameless flirts. So we hit it off right away. And over the course of our friendship, pretty early on, I learned that she's polyamorous. Now, I've been a serial monogamist, as is my duty as a dyke, for like my whole fucking life. I have just jumped from one tragic romance to the next. I didn't really have a lot of experience that was good in this area. You know, I had a lot of preconceived notions that society puts into your head about polyamory, and I just, it just freaked me the fuck out, you know? But I found that over the course of my adventures in San Francisco and the Bay Area, meeting new people, performing and everything, there are a lot of motherfucking polyamorous people out there, <laughs> which is awesome. And I love that diversity in this area, you know? But it got to sort of feeling that when you're a total fucking pervert like I am, and you're kinky as shit, and you're monogamous, you're like a mythological animal. I mean, you're like practically a fucking unicorn. And by that rope, I'm living in a land of like polyamorous dragons, right? Now, don't, don't get me wrong, don't judge me, okay? I am not saying that dragons are just like fire-breathing, flesh-eating hedonists. They're beautiful, misunderstood creatures. But at the time, you know, I was guilty of misunderstanding them like anyone else. And I just kind of looked at Gina and I thought, man, fuck, it's too bad I'm not like that. And so I just wrote it off thinking, I'm never going to get with that girl. And about this time, the ex comes rolling back through like they always do. And she notices all the positive changes I've gone through. And she says, you know what, we should get back together. And I'm like, all right, yeah, OK, cool. So you know, over the course of this two-year period, I got to be really good friends with Gina. She was like my best friend. She really put the learn on me about polyamory, you know, because I was like a total fucking ignorant naivete about it. And I started to see, you know, that like it wasn't all the fire-breathing bullshit I was making it out to be, you know? There was really nothing threatening at all about it. And I became to like appreciate the way that Gina had connections with other people. And during this whole time, my relationship was just in a fucking tailspin. I mean, it was like complete with cliche lesbian deathbed, you know? <laughs> and for a fucking pervert like I am, to go from my like thrice a day bang to like maybe once a month is like cruel and unusual fucking punishment, you know? So I'm like withering inside, and this is terrible. 
And, you know, I would call my girlfriend out on it. You know, I would say, like, look, I just think we want different things, you know? And, like, we're starting to grow apart, you know? And she would just feed me a ream of excuses and promises and apologize, and she would just string me along for another couple of months, you know, without sex or any of that good shit that comes with a relationship. So it became kind of a kissing Jessica Stein, like really weird friendship kind of jam. And because I am loyal, I stayed with her until she decided that she was done and she broke up with me. So here I am. It's like six months of no sex to speak of. And if it is, it's like routine, like I could be doing this by myself right now while filing my taxes kind of shit. <laughs> Awful. I'm horny as fuck. Fuck, I'm single again, and I'm looking at Gina, and I'm thinking, that's fucking it. I am not going to stare at what I want most of all in the eye anymore and avoid it. But it's not exactly you can walk up to your best friend after two years and say, like, hey, I'm a huge emotional boner for you. Let's do this, you know. That doesn't really go over so well. So I had to get a little slick about this. I had to get a little creative. So I waited. I did my time. And about a month later, my opportunity arose. We're hanging out. I'm hungover, because this is kind of my jam as a poet. And uh, I don't have any plans that night. And she says, oh, man, I got to go back to Oakland. I got to go to this friend's birthday party. And I'm like, oh, can I tag along? And she goes, sure, yeah, they said we could bring friends. I'm like, awesome. And she goes, huh, no, wait. You may not be ready for this party. And I'm like, why not? You know? And she says, well, I mean, there's going to be a lot of polyamorous people there. They're going to be doing their thing. You know, are you cool with this? And I'm like, just bring me the fucking party, you know? Let's go. Let's go. So we go to the party. Dragons all over the place. And I'm going to set the scene. There's a hot tub. People are drinking. They're laughing. They're having a good time. Everybody's getting naked. And I am a total voyeur pig. So I'm like a pig in slop at this party because it's like hog heaven. I get to just watch people be naughty. And I don't have to do anything about it, you know? So it's like, Yeah. So I'm super excited, and sometime after birthday cake and communal birthday spanking, one of her friends says to her, you know, Blythe, can you do me a favor? Like, I'm, I'm begging you, will you just do whatever the fuck you need to do to get Gina into this hot tub? She had not gotten in yet, which is completely uncharacteristic for her. So I have never stripped anyone down to their birthday suit faster than that moment. You know, I just <laughs> close off. And I deposit her neatly into this hot tub, and I stand over the edge, and we flirt for a long time. And eventually she gets out. She puts on just a towel. We sit down by the fire pit, and we're making s'mores, and somehow I just accidentally got chocolate, like, all over my fingers. <laughs> and so I decide that this is the perfect moment to make my move, and I say to Jenna, you know, you beat deer and lick that off, you know? And she does it, but she does it so fast, because we're in the friendship zone, that I can hardly feel her mouth. And I'm like, no, 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 girl, you gotta slow down. That's not the way it's done. Let me show you, let me show you how it's done. So I get her fingers covered in chocolate, and just to make sure that there's no mistaking my intentions, I proceed to deep throat them. <laughs> She's like, whoa, oh, you're really getting your teeth in there, and you're, wow, okay, you know. So now, things are getting interesting. We have a little thing to work with here. You know, when we proceed to flirt and have a lot of fun, it's four in the fucking morning before I know. We gotta go home. Ordinarily, I'm like a night owl. I'm manic as shit. I could drive home. I could drive to Santa Barbara if I wanted to right then. But I make up this lame excuse. I say, you know, like, oh, Gina, you know, I'm just so tired. I don't think I can make it back to the city, you know. Can I stay over at your place tonight? She goes, oh, sure, you must stay over. That's fine. We'd had strictly platonic sleepovers before where nothing had happened. So this was not, like, totally out of the ordinary. So we get home, and by the time we get there, my nerve is just gone. I'm like a total flaccid flag in the wind. And so I can't do it. I'm just like, fuck, oh, my God. So we crawl into bed, and we go to sleep. The next morning, I wake up, and her cock block of a fucking cat is sitting there in the crook of her hip. And I have to watch the sunlight tilt across her back and her tattoo and all this shit. And I'm fucking poet. So this is like my own private hell. And I'm writing like this poem to her, like just a million poems are going through my brain. And I'm sitting there just like not making a move. But I swear to God, I would have. That fucking cat hadn't been there. It's the only time in my life pussy's ever gotten in the way. <laughs> so she finally makes like stirrings of getting up and I fly out of the bed all fucking awkward and I'm like oh my god dude I am so hungover we have got to get coffee and I have to have a cigarette like now like must you get up you know and she gives me this look like come back to bed I'm like Gina get up so we get up and I write down this poem on paper and we go out and this should have been called like hangover in the park and been like a queer romantic comedy because the whole day was just a train wreck of near misses you know we're sitting on the lake she's playing with my mohawk we go back to her house we watch a movie we have to like cuddle on the bed with her mac her like macbook just like humming on my crotch i'm surprised the battery didn't just go up in flames <laughs> 
but nothing happens. And it gets to the point of the night where I should like kiss her, shit, or get off the pot, and I can't do it. I freak out, I leave. Because I know if I kiss her, it's going to be like fucking three days of epic sex. And we have to be at work in the morning. <laughs> so I go home. But I'm not a total fucking loser. I confess that I have feelings for her and I've wanted her this whole time by a text message. It's so meta, you can totally label me a hipster for my fucking clothing right now. So we decide to torture ourselves because we're total sadomasochists. They're gonna wait until the following Friday to hook up just to fuck with each other, you know? So it's Wednesday. I'm on my way to a gig in Modesto. I'm gonna be their slam feature. And I get into a three car pile up on 580. Boom! My car is totaled. My body is in fucking ruin. But the show must go on, right? So I make it to the fucking venue and I perform the feature with whiplash. I go home that night and I crawl into bed thinking this is not fucking good. I wake up the next morning and I'm like, whoa, I'm getting older, but it should not hurt to swallow like this. So it's off to the doctor with me. Eight x-rays later, I found out my body is just in fucking epic ruin. I've got whiplash, I've got three dislocated ribs, my spine is an accordion, I impacted this whole leg. My fucking arm, my fucking arm is impacted and I can't use my wrist. So thank God I'm ambidextrous in bed. So I tell Jean about the car crash and she says, you know what, that's enough. I'm going to see you tonight. You were in a car crash tonight. And I'm like, okay. So we go to my last gig of the week. We go to the local watering hole, and she knows the way to get into a poet's panties is to read them poetry. So I'm sitting at this bar with an ice pack on my neck and my back, and we're reading poems to each other, and we just start kissing. And it's like, if that accident hadn't lit up my body like a Christmas tree already, that makeout session certainly fucking did it. So we get the fuck out of there and get back to my house, like right at the stroke of midnight. <laughs> we walk in there, and it's a good thing that I'm kinky as shit because I have a high pain tolerance to be able to actually fuck in this condition. But I have never laid out ice packs to fuck on like that for any medical purpose before. So she, you know, we just rip each other's clothes off. She lays me down, and I have not been fisted at this point in damn near seven fucking years because I've been hooking up with all the wrong people, right? Faster than you could say love glove, Gina's got her fist practically buried. But I can't really finish it off because I don't have any spine movement to be able to drive it home. But still, she just completely blew my mind. And I was like, you know what? I am going to fuck her good for this. I don't care if I'm in a bad you know, condition. I'm going to do this. It's two years of buildup. I owe her big time. So, you know, I found that night that the solution to when you have whiplash and you want to eat a girl out, and I'm, I'm urging you not to try this at home unless you're truly a professional or a fucking idiot like I am, <laughs> is to have an ergonomical pillow and just say, will you sit on my face? So she did that. And we get into rounds of marathon fucking, you know? And that's basically what I call anything that lasts over three hours. So Gina likes to call me a porn star these days. And that's because I'm fairly notorious for getting into these positions where I'm something like a spider monkey crossed with an Olympic like wrestling gold medalist. <laughs> and that night I was more like a sloth to win the bronze, but I gave her my all, you know? We get to bed at six in the morning, wake up with two hours of sleep and gotta walk in there, you know, head up high, like get to work. But I'm telling you now, I have been walking on air ever since. Because there is nothing more amazing than just ditching all the fucking bullshit people put on you and deciding that, you know what, it doesn't matter. I'm going to be comfortable with who I am. I'm going to love these experiences that I have. I'm going to live my life to the fullest. So I'm going to encourage you all to really ditch the bullshit because it's holding you back. And you're going to find that you're a winner again and again and again. Isn't she fun to watch? They are making out like motherfuckers down here.